Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's show is part three of a three-part interview we did with Skunk Baxter. In this clip, Skunk talks about being a studio musician and what all is involved with that, as well as how he became a member of the Doobie Brothers. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, the great Skunk Baxter. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame with Skunk Baxter, rock and roll Hall of Fame inductee, one of my favorite guitar players. Thank you, When sir. we cut, thank you. Uh, when we cut away, um, we were going. We were talking about uh, the great stuff that you guys did with uh, st with Steve Dan, and you being a session musician. And I want to. I want your take on what a a session musician is, and and how did you become a session musician and and then we'll, the other thing I think we want to touch on is Dibby Brothers. Well, again, being in, in New York and um, getting an opportunity to do some recording sessions, you know, getting into the scene, being, working at Danny's and meeting all the cats. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I met Dave Spinoza and Hugh McCracken and, you know, the guys that were working, doing that stuff, he, Vinnie he, Bell. Hugh, Hugh came in our original museum. I met Hugh, he's a good guy. Oh, what a wonderful And, and I interviewed um, David, one of my first interviews was David in That in solo on Right Place, Wrong Time. He told me the story and it's, it's one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Absolutely, just okay, Yeah. one take, in and out, and he was doing another session. And they didn't pay him. <laughs> no, the, both guys who love Howard Roberts, by the way. Yeah. You know, again, more Howard Roberts babies. And I've got a Howard Roberts prototype in here, too. So. Oh. Yeah, so. And, you know, God bless you, Howard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the whole studio thing to me, listen, I am absolutely um, honored to be in the Rock Hall of Fame and to, you know, be a, a well-known, successful musician. And it's a tremendous honor to be first call. Yeah. You know, like... And, and I, I'm very lucky. I can be in both worlds. Lukather, same thing. Mm -hmm. Steve, Toto's great band. And, you know, first call guy. So um, I guess I, I got a chance to fulfill both. But being a studio player is a very different kind of deal. Again, who are you, who are you working for? Mm -hmm. But it is a true test of your capability, of your abilities. Um, you know, you'll be doing a jingle. And some guy will come, you know, who studied cello in high school. You know, now he's an expert in, in music. Um, I think we have to raise the volume an octave. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no problem. And, or I'm not getting enough green. No, as a matter of fact, I got just the thing here. You know, let me plug this in and, you know, you'll be just fine. Uh, tell you one quick session story. <clears throat> Uh, my music partner, C.J. Vanson, who I just did my solo album with, we're going to release that in February. Mm -hmm. um, frightening musician. Um, I used to go to Universal Studios in Chicago to do jingles. Like, I'd sleep on the couch, you know, start 7 a.m. on Monday, sleep on the couch, and leave, go back to L.A. on Friday. And we'd just do, you know, five or six sessions a day. Mm -hmm. um, so one day, it was, I think it was a Thursday, um, a gentleman who will remain nameless, but who is a brilliant jingle writer, one of the top jingle writers and producers in town, comes into the studio and he is baked. I mean, you know, his hair is like this <laughs> and he hasn't slept in a couple of days. And you, you, yeah, okay. Uh, and I'll just say Bobby, you know. So Bobby walks in and he's going, okay. Uh, uh, what, uh, so I said, what are we doing today? Uh, we're doing Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt. Okay, great. Uh, oh, you, you got the charts, the music? And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, right here. So he opens up his briefcase and he pulls out the charts and there, it says Hyatt and it's got a time signature and a key and 64 bars. And so he says, here you go, you guys ready? Sure, absolutely, count it off, let's go. And that's when I realized, number one, that 
you know, this was the culmination of all of this stuff that you're supposed to learn and be able to do. Right. And number two, that I could play with C.J. Bassett. We composed it on the fly. Right. And they loved it. Yeah. You know, and, and some of my, what, my, what I've done on my solo album is C.J. and I just playing. Yeah. You know, and then cutting it off and, you know, like taking a piece of toffee and wrapping it up and there's your, you know, there's your package. Being a studio guy is the, is the, to me, the epitome of doing your craft. It's the ultimate journeyman where you are expected to do whatever they tell you to do. And sometimes they'll say, you got 16 bars, give me some skunk. Mm -hmm. Fine, I'm in, you know, give me the click, let's roll, let's do that. Or here's what I want you to play. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember one time, a wonderful uh, 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 arranger named David Campbell. Uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly what the project was. You do enough sessions and everything becomes a big blur. Mm -hmm. But uh, a, the guy had come in, there were two of us, and I'm not going to say who the other guy was. And he said, okay, I, I want you guys, this is something I need you guys to do. It's 27 pages, and we got to do it in one shot. And the other guy said, you know, that's... That's not for me. So, you know, I'm stupid. I said, sure, let's do it. So what they did is they taped all 27 pages together. They ran, they put on like 14 or 15 or 16 music stands. And then I got on a chair with wheels and Dave Campbell was wheeling me down. And so I'm, you know, I'm playing the chart and he's wheeling me down and one guy's holding the headphone and another guy's holding the, the, uh, the guitar cable and they're wheeling me down in front of the charts and I'm like playing this stuff as we go off. And I said, yeah, sure. Crazy. I'm in. I'm in. That sounds like a Tommy Tedesco thing. Well, and it? Tommy was one of my, again, he was one of my mentors. Yeah. First session I ever did in L.A. Four guitar players. I screwed up in bar five right away. Then Tommy goes, somebody, the producer was really hard Who the hell, who's, who did it? And Tommy goes, it's me. And he turned to me and said, everybody gets one. And so Tommy and I became very close friends. We used to do the, the Tommy and Skunk show at the Guitar Institute of Technology. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, we- That's put, cool that he did that. Again, those, th those are the kind of people, if you have them in your life, can change your life. Uh, uh, you know. Speaking of Luther, he had a story exactly like that where they, they'd put some crazy music in front of him and he's sitting there sweating, you know, and he's already, he's already kind of late getting to the session, which was, you know, no, no. And he said the guy reached over at the last minute and changed, gave him the, you know, the kindergarten stuff and took, the, and took it off. There you go. You know. So to me, being a studio guy was very important because, you know, we all have goals. And one of my goals was to be first call. Yeah, well, yeah. you did that, and, you, and again, you, there's so many, I can't even begin to touch on, we don't have enough tape or time to, to, to talk about all that you've done, but I think everybody wants to hear some Doobie Brothers stuff as sure. well, you know, which was another incredible thing that you've been Well, again, of. right place at the right time, very lucky, Steely Dan was opening for the Doobie Brothers, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they were very, they were very kind, and uh, the Doobie Brothers, as a touring band and, and as a headline act, treated everybody really well. I mean, went out of their way. And so they, they were coming to the sound check, and like everybody else, they were kind of interested in what the hell is this all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the gentlemen in the band, Pat Simmons, said, listen, would you like to come and you know, maybe play a couple songs with us? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'm a, I'm a session rat. I'm a guy, you know, what, you know count it off. And two songs turned into four songs, turned into eight songs, turned into half the show, and then turned into, since I played drums as well, one of the other drummers wanted to play percussion. So I would do a, a good chunk of the show playing drums, a good chunk of the show playing guitar. And then I was at, actually out touring with the Doobies. We were in, uh, playing the Nebworth Festival in England and when I got the call, it, it said, just, you know, Steely Dan, we're not going to tour anymore. We're just going to, you know, be a studio band. And I thought, you know, I like touring. Mm -hmm. This is fun. I don't want it. So I, you know, hung up the phone and I said, well, that's kind of it for Steely Dan. I just, we're not going to tour anymore. And uh, the Doobie Brothers said, oh, you're in the Doobie Brothers now. So, oh. Yeah. 
Okay. No laps. Great. Yeah. 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 That was about a three second, you know, delay. Yeah. And I was fascinated with the band. I liked them anyway. And I always thought that the band had tremendous musical potential. The players in that band were, I mean, this is not a, a review of Doobie Brothers music. I think the players in the band were not playing to their potential. They were playing great music and it's always good to have another place to go. So when I joined the band, a couple of things happened. Uh, one was I, uh, when Tommy Johnson had some health problems, mm -hmm. uh, Michael McDonald had been touring with us in Steely Dan and I brought Mike in to, uh, to, uh, to take, not take Tommy's place, but to, to be there. It, it, yeah. And yeah, yeah, I flew him out to, to New Orleans. We had, Tommy had gotten um, very sick. We were playing, the, I think it was the Superdome. Mm -hmm. And I went out and said, ladies and gentlemen, you can either have your money back or give us, give us 10 days. Nobody turned their money in. Mike flew out. We rehearsed 18 hours a day for like 10 days. And we went out and played and we got five encores. So, okay, that worked out well. So you're the one that brought Michael McDonald. Yes, I did. I did. I mean, you had to make a command decision. We had to do something. Yeah. And uh, Mike and I were friends, and you know mm -hmm. we'd, we'd been doing a lot of work together. So the next thing was we were, <clears throat> when we were in the studio, I still have a sort of a residual Steely Dan DNA. And I thought, you know, I got an idea. How about all you guys come start doing sessions? And this means downbeats at nine, show up, the, the sort of the, the studio musician Mentality, philosophy. Yeah. And so um, um, I, it was Carly Simon and um, uh, Hoyt Axton and Leo Sayer, and the band showed up as a rhythm section and kicked ass. Mm -hmm. Great playing. I mean, I think Tyran is one of the most underrated bass players on the planet. Mm -hmm. This guy is mm -hmm. frightening, mm -hmm. you know. Not, I mean, every, and everybody else is great players too, I'm just saying that. And then something happened. Um, the band was, as a, as a band, was kind of loose. And you know, a rockin', you know, good, good feeling, you know, rock band. <clears throat> and I remember Keith Knudsen, when we were doing, I think it was the Minute by Minute album. He said, you know, I, I dropped a snare drum beat in bar 56. I thought, all right, mm -hmm. all right, you, you got it. And that was the kind of attitude that everybody had. And again, not that they you know, weren't great musicians. I will never say that because mm -hmm. that's not true. But they had all of this incredible potential. And so that's how I think the Minute by Minute album came about because of that incredible same thing, you know, you're, you're, are you a studio guy and you're a live musician mm -hmm. and you mix the two and you take the responsibilities and the goals and experience from both of those things. I had this conversation with Garth about talking about, you know, because Garth has his studio band and then he has his live band. And we were talking about the differences between, and the studio guys, the difference is, you know, of course, obviously your studio band creates what the live band plays, but yeah. but well, look at the Wrecking Crew, you know the Wrecking Crew, of course. <clears throat> but that's one thing I love about the guy that's playing guitar that took Don Felder's place. He says, "Look, I'm copying what Felder created." He says, "I'm I'm not the one that created this. I get the the glory for it when I play it live, and the crowd goes nuts." But you know, and I, I really respect him for for let, for saying that. But the studio guys have to know when to play and when not to play was kind of the gist of that conversation. Well, the, 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 the operating, <clears throat> the operational concept is <clears throat> nowhere, yeah, no, the holes are the best. Mm -hmm. Gary Katz called me one time and said, I just finished this album. I want you to come in and, 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 and l tell me what I need. And I'm paying a triple scale and bring all your gear. So I show up for the date, I listen to the whole record, I said, Gary, doesn't need anything. He says, that's why I called you. Yeah.
Right there you go. That's the and that's the that's the thing. Knowing when not to play is as important as knowing when to play. But live bands have to fill in the gaps to keep to keep the excitement going. You know, live. live well, bands. yes and no. I mean, I, I did a gig with Ingvay uh, Malmsteen one time in, in Japan, and that guy is a, just an amazing. I mean, he's the Paganini of guitar players. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's. <clears throat> let loose a flurry of hemi semi demi quavers. Mm. I'm thinking, what am I going to do, right? You know, so I just stepped out, and and I bent the G string up a whole tone, mm -hmm. and I held it, and I held it, and everybody's going to and and I held it, and then I kept holding it, and the audience finally went absolutely nuts. So okay, you've got to find the Right spot is what you don't play sometimes. Right. It's can you create can you create a comp musical composition with one note? I guess so. Yeah. You know? And it, even though it wasn't silence, it was, <laughs> it was very linear. I guess. Right. right, yeah, yeah. Well, man, look, I know you guys ease on here, but oh, well, thank, thank you so, you so much, much for, for coming in. Oh, I, I really it's really a real honor. honor. Look at the people that, are, that, that grace the walls and the museum that you have. It's an incredible honor. Well, it's an incredible honor to have you here. And uh, anyway, thank you all for watching Musicians Hall of Fame backstage. Hope to see you soon.